John Vest is the extension agent for Floyd County with the Virginia Cooperative Extension. His expertise helps novice and experienced farmers produce quality livestock and crops throughout our region. John has offered to share his experiences with our audience and provide them with the knowledge to keep agriculture strong. This is the Ag Show with John Vest. All right, viewers. The uh, I have behind me right here a round bale. It makes no difference whether we're considering uh, round bales, square bales, giant squares. Uh, the fact of the matter is, we're trying to put up and provide a usable forage that's going to be of good nutritional quality uh, for our livestock well into the winter and or future months. And every farm's a little different. We can. Uh, we can oftentimes talk about uh, a particular county or a region within our area, our larger uh, New River Valley area, uh, and for the most part we can talk about the similarities of those forages and those um, desirable products that we would grow as a forage, uh, but without having an understanding or having done any testing to actually determine the quality of that forage, uh, we really have no baseline. We have no determination to, to really help us in our decision making upon how much grain we might want to ad uh, add for some uh, extra energy or protein or uh, the various uh, components necessary to really help our herd along. Uh, usually during that period of the year uh, when they're not eating this good healthy green stuff all day long and are subject to what we're feeding them. Now, if we think about our fields in general and hay production in general, um, the whole purpose of the testing in my mind is to really look and determine the, uh, the quality of the product that we're putting up. Each farm is different in that we have mixed grass hay. We may have uh, certain cool season varieties that we've planted specifically for hay. Uh, we may have certain warm season varieties of forage that we're using in hay and baleage and haylage and things. So there's, depending on what type of forage is being grown, certainly indicates uh, certain levels of um, both protein or total digestible nutrients and the, the various things that make that hay a higher quality hay, particularly to certain animals. So if we're talking whether it be small rumen like uh, sheep and goats or cattle or even horses, um, you know, the majority of our uh, mixed grass hay comes back in a reasonable uh, uh, low protein level. Uh, we'd like to have it somewhere between 10 and 12 or even better, but for the most part those of us that are growing mixed grass hay in those types of systems, um, that's what we're shooting for is that particular level in protein. We also would like a total digestible nutrient or a TDN that is preferably high enough that's going to offer some additional um, quality, not just to that uh, to that bull calf or that you know, that uh, excuse me, not just to that um, steer calf or heifer that we're trying to raise, but say we have a mama cow or a young mama with calf, and uh, we're trying to help them through. Uh, their milking process, or maybe we're dealing with dairy cattle in general. Um, those levels of nutrients and stuff that we're providing in hay, uh, we really ought to determine that quality so we can meet it with whatever supplemental needs are necessary. In the case of this hay here, we've got a mixed grass hay from here in Floyd County. This is typical cool season grass that we would spot or find just about anywhere in our area. A uh, mixture of fescue, orchard grass. We have some timothy here and there uh, dotted throughout this particular field. And the best way for us to determine the actual quality is to send a sample of this hay off for analysis. Now, our analysis that we typically conduct is through an independent laboratory 
uh, Cumberland Valley Analytical Services. They're located up in, uh, I believe it's Waynesboro, Pennsylvania, but certainly up in Pennsylvania. And you talk about a responsive team. Uh, I, I'm really impressed anytime we send samples off and have the ability to, um, to get the, you know, the material sent up to Pennsylvania, usually the, the turnaround time is within days if it reached them during the week and certainly no longer than a week if they've got, had to go through a weekend. So the results can come back to your computer or can come back to your extension agent's computer or yours, your email, and you can have those conversations necessary for determining how to tweak uh, your forages or your supplemental program uh, to best serve your livestock needs. Now what I'm gonna to try to do right here is just briefly demonstrate how we go about the, the process of doing a hay sample. Uh, back in the day, um, we would have a, a big old bit and I would sit here and twist back and forth with hand. And, uh, fortunately, now that our drills have gotten up into some of them brushless models and a little, little more impact, we have the ability to drill right into these bales and get the desired sample we're looking for. Now, the reason, uh, this uh, particular, this is a hay core, and it's got a blade up here, teeth on the very end. It's a hollow shaft, roughly 24 inches long, that allows me to drill into the hay bale and take a full cross section as, as it goes through or travels through every, every revolution um, as, the, as the bale was being picked up throughout the field. Therefore, that's why it's important oftentimes, I try to stress this, particularly to those that are doing their hay sampling on their own, which is no reason why you can't. It's not rocket science. But by all means, it's important to try to get a cross section. So if you can't do it from the front of the bale or the side of the bale like what I'm showing you here, I'm gonna to explain to you in just a moment or two how we address that from the edge of the bale as well. The nice thing about using the, the core sampling tool is that as it cuts through, it's actually grinding and cutting a certain um, size and, and uh, level of uh, forage that's dropping into our bucket. And then we'll add that material uh, to our plastic bag. And once we've accumulated enough material uh, basically to fill nearly a freezer bag full, a Ziploc freezer bag, that's usually enough quantity for the analysis to be done at the laboratory. If we're dealing with a hay, uh, just a given hay situation where we've got our net wrap here, we certainly don't want to get the net wrap wound up in our uh, wound up in our drill and stuff. So you have to make sure that you got some separation uh, between the the auger bit itself and where we're going in. You'll place the the drill against the the bale, and you'll start to work right on in with your um, with your auger and your drill. And as we have now accumulated a sample um, several inches long in the, in the auger itself, we'll punch back through and have all the sample accumulate in the little pail here at the end. And what we're looking for with each, with each bore into a bale of hay is to have a material that's already fairly cut down in size and uniformity for, with, uh, for which they can do their analysis and their testing on. As you can see, this is hardly enough to finish a, a Ziploc freezer bag, but at the same time, if I've done this on several locations, we don't want to sample just one bale. That would be just representative of one line in the field. We certainly want to make our way around and sample those additional bales in the field. And then that one representative sample is, is accumulated from all those random uh, placed in one bag, and that's what we'll actually send off. Now, in the event that you have a low, a low battery, which is obvious from my tool right there, the, uh, we can get away with sampling from the side of our bale. And so if I could bring the camera around here 
to y'all's to y'all's left I'll show you what I'm looking for with regards to uh, sampling at the edge of a bale it is important that uh, we try to get a representative sample not from just one spot in the field uh, this is why when we bore in the side or straight in I'm getting multiple points of collection from across the transition or the the area that the tractor and the, the baler um, traveled. In the event that I want to take a sample from the side, it does me no good just to grab here in one location out here at the end and call this a sample. Certainly that's one, one start to the process, but then I'm going to want to come back in several rows deep or several revolutions deep in the bale, pull another sample, several revolutions further, pull another sample and you know all the way working my way down until I can get all the way down to my core center of my bale. Now there's a sample that before I can send off they really would like to have chopped up and have it uh, as close to the appearance of um, a, a board sample as possible. Uh, so if you don't send this sample in cut up or chopped up, um, just regular garden shears or um, whatever cutter you choose to use, uh, they're going to charge an additional fee for uh, having to cut this material up once it arrives at the laboratory. But that being said, as long as your material, um, you've taken the chance to chop that material up into something just like this right here, um, that's appropriate to be bagged and sent away for a hay sample. Now, just like this sample that I initially did was from one spot in the bale, but it took into account each of those locations. I've done that on the side of this bale, but this is just one bale. Once again, for your average field or um, we like to think in terms of you know, 150 to 200 rolls or uh, a considerable amount of uh, hay that's been accumulated um, to have a sampling done uh, for every 200 rolls, for instance. So uh, here's, here's one sample cut up. We'd visit five or six other bales and all those five or six bales with all the material that we cut up and prepare and sent as one sample will then represent roughly the 200 bales that we've picked up in that field or that particular um, uh, first cutting, second cutting, whatever it may be. So there's the importance of, like I said, just not coming here and trying to core from the center. Uh, if, you core from the, if you core from this edge like this using this device, you're staying within one actual bat of hay all the way across. We'd like to have the the, the random sampling going down or traveling through the core of the, the bale itself. And if you can't rely on the tool, there's no reason why it can't be done by hand, but once again, concentrating on going down through several layers, cutting the material up, adding it to the bag, and then you've got an appropriate sample to be mailed off. Now, I do want to mention with regards to Cumberland Valley and their, their laboratory. They have both, uh, certainly have excellent uh, website internet services where they answer various questions and stuff for you and there's different analysis and stuff that can be made with regards to concerns about specific, specific situations. I had, did have a viewer that has sent in a question about nitrates and nitrate in hay as, have, as far as having a concern um, with feeding it to their animals. And by all means, for those of us that don't necessarily practice the older fertilizer schedule, but maybe the newer fertilizer schedules where we're splitting an application after first cutting, and then another in the fall, and we're putting down additional nitrogen levels in periods that could turn off hot and dry, there is always the potential for nitrate poisoning, I guess, to occur, but it's usually uh, always followed by a weather or a situational occurrence that has created that possibility. For instance, we fertilize heavily with a high nitrogen fertilizer, 
and for whatever reason, it turns off hot and dry. Or maybe we get a little shower, and then it turns off hot and dry for six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks in a particular uh, growing cycle. And then suddenly we get a large weather event where all the rain occurs and comes at one time. And in the process of that heavy rain, all that nitrogen is taken up at one time and is deposited there in that plant. Now, if it's not prepared, if it's not ready to be hayed at that time, it's going to continue to work its way out and through and the plant's going to utilize and we're going to lose certain amounts of nitrogen and everything's going to work out fine. But in the event that the haying process is done, once again, based on that situation, right there behind the uptake, and we've got a heavy nitrogen, uh, nitrogen or nitrate load in that particular forage, we can absolutely end up with nitrate issues. So once again, if I had a concern about that, I could get out there and sample that particular hay um, or that particular, you know, like I said, that particular group of hay that's been made and send off a sample to Cumberland Valley and they'll, they can run specific for uh, nitrate levels and tell you whether or not you're with any level of a, of a poisoning concern. The same way they would do with um, various bacteria or other uh, mold issues and things like that. So um, it's as, as good a diagnostic tool when it comes to identifying the things we certainly don't want in our hay as it is uh, for determining the baseline and the overall quality, um, both, like I said, from the protein levels, the digestible nutrient, the total uh, TDN and stuff, all those things that would help us make decisions on how best to feed our animals, um, certainly from just the, their general sampling and submission. So once again, just wanted to make everybody kind of aware of the hay sampling process. Uh, and if you haven't done it, Maybe it's just a good idea to establish that baseline, to know in the back of your head that, hey, my fields A, B, and C, they were sampled at one point, and my, my protein is below 10, and my TDN is hanging in the lower 50s. Well, maybe that's not enough to provide for that, uh, that cow that's still milking a calf on her side with, you know, with another calf. And, you know, we have to deal with those situations by adding or supplementing their diet. So by all means, consider the, the hay sampling as a, as a worthwhile tool in your, in your, in your toolbox. And um, you can get as fancy as you like. You can go old school if you would, uh, would like to handle it a different way. But in every case, it's, it's a, a tool worth having. So I'd encourage my viewers and my neighbors, take advantage of it. Uh, and as always, if you have a question about uh, forage and hay production or anything along the likes or how to maybe improve on your process, contact your Virginia Cooperative Extension Service or your ag agent and invite them out for a visit. We did have another viewer question I want to add to the, the one we mentioned earlier previously um, about moisture content in the hay, knowing knowing the ample time and what, what moisture level we should actually be putting hay up at. And ideally in, in mixed grass systems that are, that are going in the barn, uh, that are not being actually wrapped or um, uh, baled in line with baleage or haylage type si systems, if we're just got a net wrap or uh, just regular wound, wound jute, those hay systems or hay bales we would love to see down about a 15% moisture content. The reason being is if they're baled at a higher moisture content, 20, 25%, you know, kind of moving up in the spectrum, the potential for those hays when they're moved inside uh, the barn or whatever facility we have for storage, or if they're even packed tightly um, uh, amongst each other, uh, those bales will continue to heat and, and generate a high temperature situation, so hot as to potentially cause a fire in the barn or at the holding facility. So um, it's something we certainly, uh, we, we don't like the added moisture from the standpoint of the potential for mold or other fungal, uh, fungal organisms to, to gain entry into the bale, but we certainly don't want it 
um, so green and so, uh, so wet that we end up in a situation where it builds heat and creates a, a fire issue. Now, for those of us that have our bales that are going um, immediately into a wrapped situation, haylage, baleage, whatever it may be, we are not looking for low moisture numbers at all. We're actually looking for a moisture number in many cases that's still roughly 40 to 60 percent um, in its moisture. And I'm not talking outside or excess of moisture. I'm not talking about being freshly rained on. That's still not the moisture we're talking about. We're talking about the moisture in the product or in the forage itself. And that being said, those that are going into a wrapped situation, we need the fermentation process. We need that heating process to occur. So that breakdown and that development of that forage once it's been wrapped is reliant on that 40 to 60 percent moisture content. As we start to move down or start packing dry hay in any one of those systems, what we oftentimes can end up with is a black mold or a, uh, another type of mold or unwanted or undesirable fungus um, starting, starting in those hays where we've, we're just too dry and we get a black dusty mold situation. So it's, it's once again dependent on our system that we're choosing to use. If those of us that have the access to the, um, uh, to the hay wrappers and they're wrapping everything in plastic to allow that fermentation and stuff, we're certainly able to bale um, most of our mixed grass hays usually within a day's time. Um, I personally, along with the, um, uh, the the black wheels that certainly you know get up our hay and things uh, we've learned through trial and experience that you know three and a half four hours on a good sunlit day with a little bit of wind is all that's necessary but that's because um, before we can start rolling and, and baling that hay because it's going into a wrap situation and we need that added moisture to make the process work um, if we were going to not put it into one of those plastic systems then by all means, we would be extending it a day, two days, whatever the weather conditions are, to best allow that hay to dry down to that 15, 20% moisture level so that when we put it up for the final product, um, we're where we need to be. Well, welcome back, viewers. We've had a chance to make a short trip down the road to a field that we're preparing to, to mow down for the season. And uh, I wanted to add a few more thistle uh, to our table of plants that we've already discussed. I'm going to be uh, begin with this particular variety right here. This is plumeless thistle. And unlike the bull thistle that we saw before, um, you notice it does have a much smaller uh, seed head on top. That doesn't mean that the seed isn't uh, any less uh, prolific with regards to when it blows out and blows across a field is viable for years and years, much like the bull thistle. This one is also a thistle that is biennial in nature. It doesn't have a root system that is spreading, uh, providing for you know, patches of this particular thistle um, to, to form within the field. That's why we typically find you know, a, a, a bunch here or there you know, scattered but you know, spotted across the particular field. Whereas in the field, in the in, with the uh, with the thistle that I'm going to show you next, the Canada thistle, it's the one that is our true concern. It's a it's a perennial a perennial thistle that has that root system that continues to spread. It too is a biennial thistle, grows out as a rosette during its first year of development. Its second year puts up these nice tall seed stalks, um, a relative relatively pink but smaller flower than what we would see on bull or musk thistle and um, once again at the end of the second season if this is mowed off right now while the the flowers have not had a chance to produce a viable seed then we have prevented this particular plant from becoming a further problem if we allow it here on the very far side i'll try to pull this over without getting poked too badly once the seed has progressed 
once the flower has occurred early on and the seed has um, progressed and developed to a viable seed, it has the little fairy end on it. They'll fly off and that particular seed, everywhere it lands, is viable for years and years. So we're going to take a moment. We're going to move away from, once again, this biennial thistle called plumeless thistle. And we're going to move over here to a patch of Canada thistle and give you an example of what you really need to be keeping an eye on in either your pasture or hang situation. Well, welcome back neighbors and friends. We're finally to our, our last position in the fields that we're going to be viewing today or visiting today um, to really demonstrate to you what I consider to be uh, the, one of the most difficult weeds I have in the county to deal with, and that is Canada thistle. Um, much like the hemp dogbane that we saw earlier and the uh, milkweed with the ability for those plants to grow an underground root system that is extensive, um, Canada thistle has the ability for its underground root system to not just be lateral, but can also be somewhat vertical in the soil, seek out even in drier soils, the ability for it to transfer and move across a particular field, whether it be pasture or hay field. In the situation, uh, like I've mentioned, we've seen the bull thistle. Um, we've talked about the bull and the musk, but having similar seed heads, nice and big and uh, very spiny leaves. We just visited the plumeless thistle uh, that has, you know, it's spiny all the way to the top, including all the way up to every, sing every single flower. But I wanted to show here one of the identifying characteristics of Canada the thistle is the fact that on its seed stalk, on its flower, there's actually no thorns and no spines to be seen or to be had. So there's your, probably the one best identifying characteristic for this particular thistle and to let you know that you are dealing with the most difficult to control and uh, probably the most difficult uh, thistle to be rid of um, is the one that doesn't have any spines as you continue up to the flower or to the seed head. Once again, uh, and if we pan down, or we'll pan down here in a few moments, um, we can actually see where this thistle, based on its rhizomes and its root system, is actually spreading out and into this field from the patch that you see behind me. It's spreading in two ways. You know, that's the underground sight unseen and the more prolific way that it tends to put itself together in patches. But if you look behind me or the camera can capture to the right of the lens, you'll see all the, the thistle seed just picking up and starting to travel across the air currents there in the background. Each one of those is carrying a seed that is easily viable in many cases up to 14 years. So it's not a simply a case of dealing with something that we can mow down like a biennial thistle and remove the seed head because it's a root system that we have to deal with. More importantly, if we allow it to progress to the point where its seed is viable and starts blowing across an area, you have a seed that is viable not necessarily year one, three, or five, but could be coming back to haunt you in your, in your hay issues or your pasture issues in year seven, nine, 11, even 14. So with regards to Canada thistle, this is one of the like I said, the more difficult plants that I have to deal with um, when making a spray recommendation and or addressing what types of spray products to use. But in every case, your extension office and or your ag agent can talk to you about the specifics and get you uh, set up with a product and a timeliness. Uh, so hopefully to save you as much money as possible to deal with this particular weed and uh, get you on the straight and narrow.